Hi, everyone, and welcome. I'm Jocelyn, our registered dietitian here at Fodzyme. I'm so excited to welcome you to our webinar and cooking demo today on navigating summer soirees and backyard barbecues. So before we get started, I just want to orient you to Crowdcast. So at the bottom of your screen, you'll see a comment and Q&A boxes. So please just keep your comments to the comments box and your questions in the Q&A box so we can keep ourselves organized. We'll get to as many of the questions as we can at the end of our session. And with that, I'm truly honored to introduce our guests today. Christine and April are GI registered dietitian nutritionists and co-founders of Amenta Nutrition, a virtual nutrition counseling firm that specializes in digestive disorders and gut health. They're true experts in helping people manage their gastrointestinal symptoms through personalized nutrition care and lifestyle coaching. And today, Christine and April will share practical nutrition advice based on the latest research so you can confidently nourish yourself and enjoy all the delicious summer foods has to offer without compromising flavor or fun. We'll also share their contact information after today's session so you can get in touch as well. And with that, Christine and April, please take it away. Hi, everybody. Hi, I'm April. I'm Christine. Thank you, Jocelyn, for that wonderful introduction. Uh, as Jocelyn mentioned, we are GI dietitians. Essentially, we help our patients manage their digestive symptoms so they can find peace in their bodies and go out and enjoy <clears throat> life and fun activities like barbecues and stories. Okay, so today what we'll be covering are um, FODMAPs and FODMAP stacking. Um, we'll review some common triggers that can often contribute to gastrointestinal or GI symptoms. Then we'll talk about some stress management tools that can be helpful, especially when you're preparing for a social situation in which you have less control over your food choices. <clears throat> Next, we'll discuss why eating a variety of foods, specifically plant foods, is so important for your overall health. And then we'll talk about flavoring foods because we need everything to taste good. And finally, we'll move into our cooking demo. We have some easy, fun, and like super flavorful foods and recipes I'm going to show you. So we hope you enjoy. And with that, April will get us started. Okay. So how many of you have felt like this girl before? You know, you've walked into a party or a barbecue and you see a big plate of ribs or you see stuff like salads and sides covered in sauces and you're wondering, you know, your mind starts racing, like, what's in the sauce? What can I eat here? Am I going to start experiencing symptoms? All of these things you start ruminating about, and you don't want to go spend the rest of your time in the bathroom, right? But you do start thinking, and you're like, hmm, maybe I'm just not going to eat. <laughs> well, we don't <laughs> want you, that. But you don't <laughs> want to seem rude, right? You want to enjoy the party. Or maybe you do want to eat the food because they used to be your favorite foods. Um, and they taste good, and you really just want to hang out, right? So, you know, it's so much thought, it's so much fear, and so much anxiety around something that should be fun and carefree. And I'm sure, like, a lot of you relate to this, so hopefully we can help with some of those feelings today. Exactly. Well, you know, if you do feel like this, you're not alone. And we hear this time and time again from our patients. You know, they experience these things around food all the time. So some of the things that we've heard before are, it's hard for me to leave my home, or it was causing me to not want to travel um, or leave my house or visit a friend or go shopping. We've heard, I would like to enjoy food again with my mm -hmm. family and friends and be able to go out to a restaurant and eat without so many restrictions. Um, or I feel frustrated and angry when I think about food. And we even hear, I feel upset because food used to make me feel so excited. And now it makes me feel confused and I can't enjoy a lot of my favorite foods. You know, the, our patients, they're afraid, they're frustrated, they're anxious, they're stressed out. And I'm sure that a lot of you might be feel the same way. Yeah, like not a session goes by that people are not bringing this up to us. And it really does affect them day in and day out. I mean, you all know we eat a minimum of what, 21 meals a week. So it, it does impact lives. Exactly. And so how common is it to feel like this or to experience GI symptoms? So in a national GI survey, a population-based audit of um, more than 71,000 participants, um, 
61% reported having at least one GI symptom in the past week. That's two out of three people who have, you know, had reflux or abdominal pain or gas or diarrhea or nausea, you know, whatever it is. And this is general population. This is general this population. Is not <laughs> somebody with irritable bowel syndrome or another uh, disorder of the gut brain interaction. Right. So if it's common among the general population, you know, obviously it's very common in the IBS population, right? Um, so, you know, we always like to think like, why are so many people having these symptoms? And what could be causing something like this for people to feel like that? And often it's related back to the food. That's right. We're going to go over some things here. So there are many different ways that food can contribute to GI symptoms. Um, how? Food has different effects. There are osmotic effects, um, chemical or mechanical effects, like the particle size of the food, right? Right, like, like the actual effect. size of the food and the bites that you're taking or what you're swallowing. Yeah, think of like a really fibrous piece of kale. You know, yeah. versus Even if you tear that with your hands, like how much effort that is. Right. Versus something like, you know, an applesauce or a puree that is. Exactly. It's pretty easy. Yeah. Um, and these can determine how quickly or how slowly uh, things move in the GI tract, right? Then there are neuroendocrine uh, effects as well as pre and probiotic effects. And these can all manifest as pain, uh, bloating, altered bowel movement, etc. cetera. So, um, for today's purposes, we'll be covering the osmotic and fermentable effects of compounds called uh, FODMAPs. And I'm sure a lot of people in the crowd today are familiar with FODMAPs, but just as a friendly reminder, FODMAP is an acronym that stands for fermentable oligo di monosaccharide polyols. FODMAPs are short chain carbohydrates found in many fruits and vegetables and other carbohydrate plant foods uh, that are poorly absorbed in the small intestine. Um, what does that mean? Well, when we eat food, we chew it, right? We swallow it and send it to our stomachs. After the food is further um, digested and broken down in the stomach, it continues down the digestive tract to the small intestine. And it is here where most nutrient absorption um, occurs. But like I just mentioned, FODMAPs are um, not absorbed. So they continue further down the GI tract to the colon. They're still intact. And this is where they are eaten or fermented by our good gut bacteria. Now, the majority of our beneficial bacteria live in the colon. Um, this is where um, the largest amount of the gut bugs are in our microbiome. And I'll touch more on the microbiome in a minute. Um, but our gut bugs love FODMAPs. Um, thus, these fermentable carbohydrates um, are also healthy um, prebiotic fibers and promote a healthy microbiome. Since they're poorly digested, though, they trigger gastrointestinal symptoms like gas and bloating, because the byproduct of the digestion of these, uh, these gut bugs are, is going to be gas. Um, so this is completely normal and expected. I think we averaged, I don't know, like 10 or 12 tubes a day. However, with patients who have um, a disorder of the gut-brain interaction like irritable bowel syndrome, these symptoms can be very painful, debilitating, and may also include like abdominal pain, uh, pain uh, diarrhea, excessive gas, and even sometimes constipation. Um, and in fact, 84% of patients with IBS report that their GI symptoms are related to the foods that they eat. So when FODMAPs are bothersome, like what can you do about it? Well, here you can see on the slide, we have a list of different ways to manage FODMAPs. First of all, you can avoid the FODMAPs which I'm sure a lot of people have, are doing or have done, but that's really hard. You know, like if you want to have a social life, if you want to go out to restaurants and things like that, it's really hard to be completely low FODMAP all the time and to avoid them. Yeah. And like I, I just mentioned, it's a lot of healthy um, foods for your beneficial bacteria. Right? Exactly. So if you have worked with a GI dietitian, um, like April and myself in the past, then you possibly have gone through the low FODMAP diet correctly, where you've um, removed all these FODMAPs and then you've definitely done a reintroduction so that you better understand for the personalization phase which FODMAPs are triggering, because it's not necessarily that all of them are triggering, and also how much of these FODMAPs that are potentially triggering can you have. Um, so the third one says watch your portion size. So once you've learned this, you might have an idea like, hmm, I can have, you know, I don't know, a, a small handful of chickpeas on my salad. Um, but I cannot have bean soup or something of that nature. So knowing what it is you can have is super important. It'll, it only not only allows you to eat more, but it'll really empower you so you feel in control over what you can have. 
Um, next, we have mind your bucket and be mindful of stacking. So I'm going to go over that in a few minutes. And then last, use your toolbox. You know, we're talking about diet, but there's other things that you can do. There's um, enzyme like Fazem, which we're talking about today, and some other stress management techniques that are helpful. Okay, so let's review FODMAP stacking because it is more likely to happen in a social setting like a party, a wedding, barbecue. You know, you're not sitting down for that single meal. You're going to be there for hours. There's going to be like a buffet. Yeah, yeah, exactly. It is that grazing like style. For those of you who are not familiar with stacking, it's when um, there are multiple, quote, green serves of a food eaten in one setting. Okay, there can be an accumulation of FODMAPs in the gut, which can cause symptoms. So, what are green serves? Um, when you see, if anyone uses the Manash app, you see the little circles like green go, that's um, um, when it's lower FODMAP for a typical portion size, and there's um, the orange and then the red, right? So, the theory is if you're eating multiple green serves of various FODMAPs, you're more likely to induce symptoms or exacerbate symptoms. I say theory because it's not something we see in the research. It's really based on observations. Now, say you've worked with your GI dietitian and you learn which FODMAP triggers um, your symptoms and you now know how much of that you can tolerate. Great. But what if you eat um, a tolerable level of that FODMAP at a barbecue? You're fine, right? Um, but what if you then have three or more servings of that tolerable portion size? And that's where um, you can you know, really get into trouble in the sense of like, having more symptoms when you could have sort of uh, avoided them or, or prevented them. So um, some of you might have heard like filling your bucket, like the more you have, the worsening your symptoms, similar that, to that. So what can you do to reduce the risk of stacking and bucket filling? Well, here we have on the slide, uh, the first thing we have here is mind your breakfast. So perhaps if you're going to a big party later on, um, be mindful of what you're eating at breakfast time. Maybe you don't want to start filling your bucket that early. Um, be mindful of what I just mentioned about um, consuming lots of green servings at once. Um, balance your meals with foods naturally in FODMAP. So say you're at the barbecue, it's like FODMAP galore, but then you notice like, oh, there's some grilled shrimp or there's some grilled chicken and it's, it's clear that there's not really a marinade on it or something. Um, maybe you're putting a little bit more of that on your plate to balance it out. Um, Something really important to remember is that everybody's FODMAP tolerance is different, and um, I'm sure something that's worked for somebody may not work for you. So for that reason, it's really important to understand what works best for you. For some people, stacking is not an issue at all. Maybe they're just focusing on like minding how much they fill up their bucket. Yeah, and I think that's a really important point is to you really have to test this yourself, mm -hmm. and it's based on the individual and not something that's out there in social media or in chat box or whatever like that. You know, it's really you have to test it, and what works for someone might not work for you, and vice versa. So yeah, unsolicited advice. I don't know. It might not be <laughs> might not be in your favor. Of note, lactose um, is not included in stacking. Okay, so. It's digested differently, and you only have to be mindful or worry about that if you have a lactose intolerance. Um, so if you're eating for over a 30-minute period, this is something to be mindful of, and it could be a great opportunity to use something like a FODZYME. And then you really want to be aware of the non-FODMAP triggers, right? Because there are non-FODMAP that um, components that can trigger you to have symptoms. That are at barbecues. <laughs> that are at barbecues. So things like caffeine, alcohol, fatty or fried foods, spicy foods, and large meals. So these can all trigger the gastrocolic reflex, which is, you know, in essence, when your stomach stretches, because food comes into it, it tells your colon to get things moving to make room. There's a little bit more to it, some hormones involved and things like that. But so that's for, today's, for purpose. today's purposes, that's what it is, right? So all of these things can trigger that. So what can you do to avoid that? Well, you know, with caffeine, maybe you only have one cup of coffee or maybe you avoid caffeine for the day um, or have it earlier in the morning. You know, alcohol, it's really important to have food in your stomach before you drink. Yes, that is a simple, that could be like a nice little quick fix for, yeah. for that. And also, you know, when you are drinking, you know, it's, it's two drinks for men and one drink for women that is recommended. A lot of times people will do more. So if you are going to do more, you know, go one-to-one um, -one with, like, you have an alcoholic drink, and then you have a glass of water. And maybe you don't know. have, like, a lot of those added sugars and fruits in the cocktail. Right. Like something it's, a little bit more simple. Exactly. 
fattier fried foods, right? Look around and see what you can have. Again, lean proteins like fish, shrimp, you know, vegetables that are low FODMAP might be good. Um, you know, you can find chicken, things like that. Um, and if you see skin or something on it, remove that because that'll just make it easier for you to digest. And then we have spicy foods and large meals. You know, we were saying before, like the large meals can trigger, mm -hmm. the portion size can trigger. And so maybe you have a small amount of something to eat before you show up at your party. Um, and that way you don't go all in with a huge amount when you're there and trigger that. Yes, and we've that sometimes. time and time again, right? People skip meals before they're going to a party. Yeah, they like prepare for the food. Yes, <laughs> we recommend you don't do that. You know, just maybe you have a smaller portion earlier in the day. And remember, like what April was saying, all of these non-FODMAP triggers, they still contribute to the quote bucket. So um, even if you're being mindful of your FODMAPs, you know, if you do have three of these with a couple of the FODMAPs, you know, that adds up. So just um, keep that in mind. Exactly. All right. So we've spoken about the food. We've spoken about FODMAPs, non-FODMAP triggers, right? So we, let's get back to where we started in the beginning with the stress and the fear and the anxi anxiety that you have around the food. So when your body is stressed out, I'm sure many of you have felt this, your symptoms will become exacerbated, right? Everything is it's like 10 worse. times, it just gets yeah. worse and worse. So when this is happening, essentially your body senses that you're having stress, it will divert blood flow away from your organs and to the necessary organs. So basically your brain and your heart to keep you alive. Um, this is evolutionary, right? Like mm -hmm. from when we were being chased by lions and things like that, but our bodies don't, which we're not chased by, <laughs> we're not anymore. chased by lions, not in New York. Um, you know, your body doesn't recognize that, you know, just your anxiety is different from that. So it automatically does that. And when that happens, your stomach emptying slows down, but your colon emptying speeds up. And that's when you start to experience symptoms. So what we want to do is try to avoid this from happening. And so our number one go-to um, tip for managing stress in the moment is diaphragmatic breathing. So diaphragmatic breathing has been proven to sort of calm that um, nervous system response, that fight and flight, mm -hmm. right? And essentially with diaphragmatic breathing, you breathe in through the nose, filling up your belly with air. You hold it for a few seconds. And then you breathe out through the mouth, emptying it. And you'll breathe out for a couple of seconds longer than the inhale. Right. And what April's really referring to today, which we don't have time to get into, is that connection between the gut and the brain, right? You have your central nervous system, and then you have your enteric nervous system, and there's a real connection there. So your anxiety and your stress is not causing your symptoms per se, but they definitely can add to them. Right, exactly. So with the diaphragmatic breathing, we recommend you do it before you walk into the party. You want to do it when you are at the party, right before you eat, um, and even after you eat. Mm -hmm. And if you find yourself getting really anxious or stressed out, you know, take a moment, take a little walk, be by yourself, go to the bathroom, whatever it is. <laughs> Have a self-care moment, exactly. Just excuse yourself. Um, go to the bathroom and do some of this diaphragmatic breathing. It really will calm you down. And then, you know, we want to make sure that you are managing your stress every day because, again, it will exacerbate and make symptoms worse. So making sure that you're getting enough movement, that you're getting adequate sleep, which is so important. Um, doing things like journaling or meditation or yoga can also help. And then there's gut-directed hypnotherapy and cognitive behavioral therapy, which which have been proven to be very helpful. And you can do that with a therapist or you can do it. There's a few apps that are available now. Yeah. And like what April mentioned about the diaphragmatic reading, you don't have to like be in a yoga pose to do this. No one's going to know you're doing it. Like it could be something that is sort of internal. It's private. It's very simple, but can be really effective. Yeah. And I recommend practicing it, True. But, you know, because the more you do it, the better you get at it. And I was, you know, originally you, you put your hand on your chest and on your belly to sort of, feel that belly filling up. And eventually you don't have get to do that. To you just get used to it and you can walk around doing it yeah. all the time. Some of our patients is a game changer. But some of our patients is a tool in our toolbox. Yeah, exactly. Okay, so our job as your GI dietitians is to provide you the least restrictive, most nutritionally adequate eating pattern that works for your digestive system. 
Some of you may have been told, maybe you received a handout and been told to go on a low FODMAP diet to manage your symptoms, or hopefully not like a low fiber or some other therapeutic diet to, that restricts food. Uh, and I'm not saying that that is not warranted. Sometimes it's very helpful. But when you don't have direction, it can be confusing and way too restricting, right? So we want to make sure that, number one, that that's appropriate for you. And number two, that you're um, following an eating pattern that's nutritious enough so that you're meeting all of your nutrient needs um, and that so that you have, like, energy throughout the day, you're being well-nourished, and um, also that you are able to heal if you need to do so. So some of our patients with digestive disorders may need to heal their gut. And if their diet's too restricted, like I mentioned, they don't have the right nourishment to do so, to restore their gut health, uh, or as, as us nutrition scientists call it, your microbiome. And when I say restore your gut health, I mean it. I'm not saying this in some hokey way, but really like an evidence-backed way to do that. There, it does exist. So just a quick reminder about the microbiome. It lives throughout your entire digestive tract from your mouth all the way to the back door. Uh, it's made up of a trillion different microorganisms that include bacteria, um, archaea, fungi, etc. And they live together ideally in harmony. Um, and we know from the research that some microorganisms are more beneficial than others. And that's why having a nice balance of these gut bugs uh, would be in your favor, favor. So how do we know which gut bugs are better for you? Well, we're still learning the specifics. Um, we know of a few. But what was revealed recently um, in the last five years yeah. um, is that people with the, quote, healthiest or most well-balanced microbiomes were those that ate at least 30 plant foods or more per week. Uh, that sounds overwhelming, but um, we remember when we demonstrate, we'll show you an example of how it's really not. Um, and this was discovered by, as you can see on the slide, the American Gut Project. They compared the microbiome specimens of essentially people donated their stool samples. They studied the, the microbial makeup of it um, and uh, of over 10,000 people. And this project is still ongoing. People, they have a lot more people now that they look at, but that's what they discovered. Um, so uh, it's really important that we make sure that we're nourishing it correctly. Because what does a healthy microbiome do for us? Lots of things. It helps uh, heal the gut lining. So AKA le uh, leaky gut, I'm sure everyone's heard of this. <laughs> Um, so when you have that nice um, gut lining that's not permeable or too permeable, I should say, then you have less risk for disease or GI symptoms. Um, it boosts your immune system. It may impact your mood because we now know that serotonin, the happy hormone, is produced in the gut. Yeah, about 90% of it is, is made in the gut. Um, having good beneficial bacteria in a nice balance can help with nutrient um, absorption. And feeding your body plant foods can also help you, quite frankly, poop well. Um, so finding uh, a diet, or as we like to call it, an eating pattern that works for your digestive disorders or your symptoms, um, that allows you to eat a variety of plant foods is ideal. So you feel good, you heal, uh, you re reduce your risk for future distresses. Um, and so it's very important. So which foods can help you heal? Lots. Um, your, your gut bugs love prebiotics, and we're in the summer, and some of uh, the seasonal veggies that um, could be really helpful are things like, like asparagus and artichokes. Exactly. Right. So, you know, Christine mentioned about the boosting the nutrition and flavor. Um, so how do we do that to ensure that you're meeting nutrients, that you're getting fiber, so that you are nourishing your microbiome? Well, pink greens. So arugula. Beet greens, cabbage, chard, spinach, you know, there's a million different lettuces. I okay, maybe not. Maybe. Um, but these are so abundant during the summer. I'm sure if you've been to the green market or something like that, you will see them everywhere. And these are low FODMAP, and it's a great way to get fiber and nutrients into your diet. Yeah, these are, like, great for, like, your base, like, your go-to um, before you explore with the other ones. Right? Exactly. Um, another thing, use Fresh herbs, I can't say this enough. It really adds a punch of flavor to everything. So basil, mint, cilantro, thyme, tarragon, chives, parsley. You know, they, like I said, a ton of flavor. They're filled with antioxidants. And they can make a plain, you know, salad, like pop, pop. 
Right. It's true. I mean, a lot of times when you look at like lower FODMAP recipes, I, uh, you know, we notice like the focus is like, let's find these low FODMAP fruits and veggies, which makes sense. Um, and you're like, how can I make this veggie or this fruit taste really good in this recipe? Right. Uh, but there's other things that you can be adding, like these herbs. Right. And, you know, especially like salad dressings, marinades and things like that, they often have like a garlic or a scallion or some, or not a scallion, I'm sorry, a shallot or an onion base or something, right? Which are FODMAPs. And so if you want to, you know, maybe not have those, but still have extra flavor, you know, adding herbs, you can create a salsa verde with just a bunch of herbs yes. and blend them together we're making with olive oil. We're making pesto in a little while. Yes. Exactly. <laughs> um, add some zing. So acid from lemons, limes, and oranges. These are going to boost flavor and brighten every dish. Um, don't forget to use the zest. It's got, it's full of oils and full of flavor. Um, and a lot of times, you know, People, when they're trying food and they think like, hmm, it's not quite there, a lot of times it does need acid. So again, mm -hmm. like lemons, limes, oranges, even vinegar is a really great thing That's to like true. brighten everything. Yeah, add, your add more acid before you add more salt. Yes. <laughs> and, and lime, like that makes an amazing marinade. So if you're looking for an alternative. Exactly. Um, and then it sounds basic, but <laughs> eat the mm -hmm. rainbow. Um, fill your plates with low FODMAP and also tolerable FODMAP fruits and veggies to make sure that you are getting nutrients and fiber. These, you know, it's bright, it's colorful, and like I said, it seems basic because it's something you're sort of yeah, in elementary, elementary school, yeah. but it holds a lot of water because who wants to like think about, I mean, people, I don't know, but who wants to think about like, am I making, am I eating all my vitamin and mineral needs? Like the more color you have, because that's where they're found, then the less you have to worry and think about it. Right. And Adding color to a plate makes it look beautiful and more delicious. Yes, like if you're hosting. You know, we sure. eat with our eyes first, right? So having the color will make that happen. So in summary, with our talk, here are a few key takeaways that you can use um, and for to help enjoy your next barbecue or summer soiree. So again, you want to be mindful of FODMAPs and stacking. Uh, fruits and veggies, but also things, you know, be mindful of sauces, marinades on proteins. Like I mentioned before, a lot of times these will have garlic or onion in them. And so you just want to be aware and maybe ask a host and what it's marinated in. Mm -hmm. um, you want to eat plenty of non-trigger foods and low FODMAP fruits and veggies um, and carbs to ensure that your nutrition is being met, right? We want to make sure we're getting all those minerals and vitamins and things like that. Um, Use an enzyme like Fodzyme to increase food, for food variety and partake with others. So, you know, when you are at a barbecue, you know, this is a great way to be able to feel like, you know, not have like your special meal. Yeah, you, you don't have with them. You don't have restriction, right? And so when you're, you know, you might wonder like, well, how do I do this without feeling weird? Yeah, like, like I'm going <laughs> to just sprinkle this white powder on my food in front of everybody. Well, yeah. It, yeah. You know, honestly, it depends on your personality, how you want to approach it. So, you know, maybe you're just explaining to your friends, like, this is just going to make me feel better so I can, like, hang out with you and, like, you know, join the party and have fun. Or you might just walk off to the side for a second and sprinkle it in private. It's like, that makes you feel better. Whatever, whatever works for you. Yeah, yeah. And just explain that it makes you feel better and digest food more easily. Mm -hmm. Simple as that. So you can hang longer. <laughs> like you said. <laughs> yeah. Um, and then again, manage in the moment stress with diaphragmatic breathing. It's a really helpful tool to have in your back pocket and you can just Google it and there are plenty of um, examples on the web. Yeah. And um, with that, April is going to jump up. Yes. She's going to, she's going to go to the kitchen, which we're in, which we're going to see in a second. Um, and this is what we're going to do. We're going to cook. Uh, lemon regatta toast with figs and pistachios. We're going to make cherry, tomato, zucchini, and halloumi skewers with pesto drizzle. And then we're going to make a bean salad with radicchio, radish, pickled onions, and marcona almonds. Actually, we're making that first. Yes. I'm going to just stop sharing my screen and I'm going to rotate so you guys can see April and I'm going to join her in a second. Okay. You guys see us? Yep. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Can you see? <laughs> All right. So as Christine mentioned, we are going to start off with a bean salad with radicchio, radish, pickled onions, 
and Arcona almonds. And I really love a big salad in the summertime. And this one is super delicious. So the first thing we are going to do, and I do want to say, yes, this does contain FODMAP. So it's the perfect thing to use your FODZYME on. Um, but there are also substitutions that you can make to still get the same flavors. Um, and those will be available in the recipes um, that FODZYME is going to put out after this is over. Yeah, even like when we provide meal ideas and recipes to our patients, like there's no rules. We're not chefs. We just love to cook. So there's a lot of flexibility here. Um, and so even if there's an ingredient you're like, oh, that's not really my jam, yeah. just whip it up. Just like, swap swap it, out. it out. Exactly. So I am adding some red wine vinegar to some onions to just do a quick pickling of them. And that really just takes that bite away and also will add a little bit of acid. So that's our first thing. We're going to set it aside. And then we're going to make a basic vinaigrette. So I have olive oil and I have um, grated garlic in it. I use a microplane to grate it. And then to that, we are going to add, yeah, I think I have it here. Yeah, microplanes are like one of our favorite tools. I think we have it on our list on our site. Yeah. Um, you can cut yourself. It's super easy. You can use it for many things. I'm going to use it for a yeah. while. Sure. So I'm going to add some, sorry, is it done? No, it's not done. Okay. I'm going to add some shallot. I'm going to add a tablespoon of water. I'm going to add three tablespoons of white wine vinegar. And like when April was mentioning, even with pickling the onions, it takes that astringency out and it makes it brings out like a little bit more sweetness. So it's not just like pow in your face. Exactly. And then I'm going to add, you know, a teaspoon or two of Dijon. Dijon is so Dijon good. Dijon is so good. It. It's got a little bit of spice and it's going to help to emulsify. Oh, and that's what happens <laughs> when you're doing food in us. Um, I'm going to add a pinch of salt and then just a little bit of pepper. By the way, you see she's using a mason jar. Here's a mason jar. And this is one of those things where if you're going to put the effort in to make a dressing, like double or triple it, it's so easy to shake it in here. It's one less thing to clean. And then whatever you don't use, you can just throw it in the fridge and use it for your salad later on. Yeah, exactly. or your green bowl or, or, whatever green bowl or whatever you're doing. Okay, so that is our dressing. And now we're going to get to the salad. So I have some radicchio in here already, but we are going to, you know, sort of go through it. So with radicchio, I've just sliced it in half, and it's got this core. I don't know if you can see it. Mm -hmm. We just want to cut it out, like so. And radicchio is, you know, everyone has different flavor profiles that they like. It's bitter, you know, obviously we we'll be putting dressing on it, but it's super delicious. It's a bitter profile. It holds up well. So if you're dressing something in advance, like you don't want to execute the moment you have your guests there, it's a great one. Yeah, have. it really holds up, and I'll even like. You can eat it dressed the next day. Yeah, like from the day, you know, before. This is true. Okay. So, we have our radicchio. And then we are going to add some parsley. And so, I've chopped it. It's about a half a cup. Just a rough chop. I don't, you know, I'm not precious with things. Like, just throw it in. So, this you're done with that. I'm done with it. Um, we have our uh, radish. Um, I've cut it into little dices. You can cut it into slices, whatever it is, however you like. You can do whatever you would like. Yeah, I mean, a lot of times when we're eating, even like the different textures of the food is what helps make it pleasurable. Right. Um, so some people like it chunkier, some thinner. Exactly. Um, then we are going to add some scallions. That was oh, really. you stole my net. That's all right. <laughs> <laughs> so, you know, you could add, ooh, that's louder than I thought that was going to be. Um, you can. Add just the greens, which are low FODMAP, right? Or add the whites if you know you're going to be using an input or something like that, or you know your tolerance, your tolerance level, right? And think about that you're, you're making an entire recipe, but then you know you can sort of do the math or imagine in your mind what the portion size is for a single serving. Exactly. And then we're going to add a can of chickpeas and a can of cannellini beans. Beans. Beans, which are such good prebiotic fiber. Yeah, um, love these. Right. And know. also, so is the, we mentioned the garlic, the scallions, mm -hmm. the uh, shallot are as well. 
And then, um, you know, and chickpeas are low FODMAP at a quarter. And if you don't want to use beans or chickpeas at all, you could easily add something like grilled chicken, you could add yeah. grilled shrimp, you could add grilled tofu if that's more your jam. Swap protein for protein. I have Marcona almonds. Uh, these are so delicious. They are a bit more expensive, so you don't have to use them. You could also just use regular almonds and toast them. You can buy them like that. You can use slivers, whatever it is. Um, yeah, these just are not as dry. They're a little bit richer. They, um, they're really um, amazing for like a charcuterie board. Um, but like April said, you could pick any, any one that you like. Right. And then we're going to add um, some grapefruit supreme. Sounds very fancy. And what you're going to do is you're going to cut both ends off. So for those of you who are unfamiliar with supreme, essentially you are going to be taking out the flesh of the, of the grapefruit slice. You don't want that fibrous um, fiber part, like the membrane. You know, it's too bitter. You really don't want your guests like trying to like pull this stuff out of their teeth while they're eating. Exactly. It's basically just getting to the fruit. Exactly. So I'm not going to do this whole thing, but essentially you cut yeah, inside the membrane. So that can move you a little closer. That's helpful. And then it comes out like this. So you can just give it a chop. And it looks fancy. It's delicious. Um, you know, grapefruit. It's I love doing this for guests because you know it might take a minute to do all to do that. Like there's a little bit more prep involved. Exactly. Yes. That's why we have it here in the bowl. We have it in the bowl. But exactly. you know, so. a lot of other people aren't doing that at home. So if you're having a special event or a dinner party, I think that they would really appreciate it. Exactly. And if you don't like grapefruit, add orange. Mm -hmm. Orange is more low pod mouth. And then the last thing we're gonna drain off the vinegar and add the onions. And then we want to, I'll take this. Yes, thank you. We want to just add a pinch, another pinch of salt, a little bit of pepper. A lot of people using salt and pepper really will heighten everything. Mm -hmm. And then we're just going to dress it, right? It's held together pretty well. Like, and you definitely make this dressing ahead of time because you have it in the jar. So it's just right before you're going to execute the serve it, you just give it a shake. It's super easy. That's it. Take your tongs. One of my favorite, other favorite tools. Exact extension of your hand. <laughs> and it is beautiful. So let's see if you can see. Yay. Yay. Um, beans, it's, it's sweet, it's sour, it's bitter, acidic. It's got all of those notes. It's audacious. It's wonderful. So I hope you get to make this and That's enjoy it. Awesome. Let's take my station here. Yep. Show you guys the lemon ricotta fig toasts. Okay. So we have figs here, which I know is not always like the easiest to find. They can they can quickly or easily be swapped out. Anything. Strawberries. Yeah, strawberries. Peaches. I mean, you can make peaches. You can make it savory with cucumber. You know, whatever you. Dream up. <laughs> right. And I think figs right now there might be in season and then they're more in season at the end of the summer. So this is something right. to think about then. But and they'll be everywhere. Right. Okay, so what we have today is I have some ricotta cheese and I have some lemon juice. Okay. Your recipe says to um zest the lemon, which I'm gonna do in a second, and then just use the juice of that lemon. Um just for today's purposes, I, I separate them. But that's what you would do. So you're going to take your ricotta cheese, stick it in a bowl with the lemon juice. Um, rubber spatulas are one of my favorite tools. I find them so easy to work with. I like the small mini ones. They're really lightweight and you can like get everything out of the bowl. Yeah. And if you have like leftover stuff in the it's jar, it's really good to it, it gets into those yeah, we're not hard to reach things. Okay, so you're going to mix the lemon and the ricotta cheese like so. You can add other things, black pepper, whatever folks you're going okay? I'm going to put that there for a second. Um, and then I'm going to take my pistachios, okay? I have whole pistachios here. And remember what I was talking about before about texture, like what you prefer? Um, so you can chop these however you want. Like if you want like a bigger bite, you, you do more rough chop. 
Um, I like to even use my um, Cuisinart, like the little mini one. You could do like a little pulse, but be careful. I don't you know how your machine is. You don't want pistachio butter. Yeah, it could, it could be or maybe you do, but not for this dish. It's like pistachio powder or something, that's, right? You know. So I'm just gonna do a rough chop, just keeping my hand like this because these, these little guys go flying. Okay, and then you could chop it like however you see fit. And if you don't like pistachios, or you know they are higher in FODMAP, you don't have an enzyme, or if they are one of your trigger foods, you could use something like, like walnuts or pecans. Um, they will be equally as delicious. Yeah, like maybe. It is um, a trigger for you, and maybe you're like, you know, I don't even like love pistachios that much. It's not worth it for me, and you just get them, right? Yeah, exactly. Okay, so I'm chopped the pistachios. I'm just going to slide them on my board here, okay? And then I have my figs. Look how beautiful these guys are. Okay, so I'm just going to cut off the top part here. Like that. And then you can slice them however you want, round. Um, I, I kind of like aesthetically going this way, if you can see me. Like this, I just think it looks like a little prettier on the toast. So you just can simply not cut yourself and slice these. <laughs> okay, and yeah, you know always be careful. careful trick, right? So that if you slip, you're not going to cut off the finger. Okay, so let's cut some of these things like so. All right, now I'm going to take one of our favorite tools, the microplane. Actually, let me grab the toast for the toast. Yeah. So. Um, I have them displayed like this because if I was having a dinner party, that's probably what I would do. Um, I like presentation a lot. Yeah, and the recipe that we're giving you is like 20 servings, so it's a full baguette. But, you know, right now we are using a baguette, but you can use any bread that you want. You can use, um, you know, ciabatta, you can sourdough. use sourdough, um, which might help. You could use gluten-free if you do that. Um, whatever you choose. You could use like a really seedy, nice, like, Nutty seedy bread. Exactly. And, you know, it doesn't have to be made for a party. You can, you know, um, decrease the amounts of the recipes. And this also makes a fantastic breakfast or yes. lunch. <laughs> that's true. Um, so, you know, you could do it on like regular sandwich bread if that's not quite super versatile. The rules are so important. Okay. Yeah. So now I've spread the ricotta on all my toasts. Okay, I'm going to drizzle the pistachio, drizzle, I'm going to sprinkle the pistachios on the ricotta part because the cheese is wet, so it's going to stick, right? So I don't want to put the figs yet, right? And especially if you're having a party, like, you don't want your guests to have something and it just, like, like they're falling apart they're everywhere fighting. and they're, like, chasing it. Yeah. So this makes it a little bit easier. Okay, and then you have your lemon, right? We're going to zest that. I'm used to doing this to get the juice smoother, but we don't have to do that for today. <laughs> okay, so I'm going to zest, and as you zest, you zest, tap like this, and then rotate. You don't want the yellow part. That's going to be bitter and not be like the white part. What I said. The yellow. Sorry. You, don't you want do the want part. the yellow part. <laughs> like what April was talking about when she was describing the lemon zest before, if you do the white part, that's not going to happen. It's not going to taste like this. And I even like how you're doing it on the board. And it's getting a little lemon zest like on the board, and it sort of makes it look mm -hmm. like pretty. decorative and pretty. Because we do eat with our eyes first, right? What we see. So that's true. All right, now I'm gonna put how beautiful these are. I'm gonna place the figs toast. You know, this toast, these are like little guys, but um, if you have like a bigger slice of toast, you can do that too. I'm just gonna put two, I think, for toast. I'm gonna put them in different directions. Whatever floats your boat. Okay. And then, to top it off, I'm going to wipe my hands a little bit. To top it off, we have this balsamic vinegar glaze. So just add uh, a brightness of the acidity and then yes, yeah, of course. Hold it together. Um, and you don't have to buy this. You can make it. We just happen to have it. Um, mm -hmm. You just, like, take balsamic and reduce it by half on the stove top. Just keep an eye on it and boil it. Then you'll have your own balsamic glaze. Okay, and then April can Board, right? Yeah. Okay. So check it out. You guys can see we have these beautiful toasts here. All right. And I will leave them. Okay. All right. So now we are going to do our halloumi and zucchini and tomato skewers. I'm going to mix them 
That's the wrong side. Right. So we have our halloumi. Halloumi is delicious. It's a um, it's a firmish cheese. Mm -hmm. <laughs> it grills really nice. It grills it's not really nice. nice to melt the grease, right? Exactly. And it's pretty salty, so you don't want to salt it. Yes. And cheese in general, right? Right. You can use cheese as your salt. Right. Course. So I have some garlic already in my bowl. I am going to double garlic it. So this is another recipe that you can use um, badzine with. Yep. And then just olive oil. So give it a little mix. For those of you who cook a lot or relatively a lot, adding a little olive oil squeezy bottle like that is life changing. <laughs> um, I'm going to add the zucchini to it, and then yep, thank you. And then the tomatoes. Okay, skewers on there. Yes, on the first. Okay, <laughs> <laughs> my skewers. And you're just going to give them a toss, right? And then we're going to skewer them, and that's it. It's that simple. Um, you know, you can do whatever order you want. I'm gonna go cheese. Yeah, yeah. and um, if you're like, I, I, I kind of want to do this, I'll just like stick some shrimp on there on the grill. Yeah, exactly. Shrimp cook really fast, the veggies cook fast, you know, something else like a chicken might take longer and the veggies might get a little overcooked. So, you know, scallops, shrimp, things like this, right? Exactly. So, I'm gonna continue doing this, and Christine is going to be making pesto. Yes, so guys, I love this recipe. I'm super happy to share it with you. Um, and let's dive in and see what it's like. Okay. Make sure we have this guy on. Yep. Okay. So garlic clove, throw it in. I'm gonna take basil, about two cups. Okay. I'm just gonna stick this around in my cuisinart like so. Okay, you can add a little salt if you want. I don't. I feel like the cheese has enough. I yeah, I find that the do. cheese is salty no. enough. I think you could use a little, sometimes a little pepper, but that's it. By the way, I know that pesto has pine nuts. We're not using them. Um, I don't use them a lot because I know you can keep them in your freezer. They go rancid. I don't feel like they impart a ton more flavor. Sure, if they were sourced sooner after they were harvested, they probably would, but I don't know. I just kind of skip it. So garlic. Um, basil. I'm going to make sort of this little basil paste, so it's going to get loud for a second. Okay, there we go. So just little, little, little tiny pieces of basil and garlic. Okay, now I'm going to add my cheeses. So I have a half a cup of Dano here. Throw in. Classic, delicious. Oh my gosh, you can, I wish you guys were here. The smell of the basil is so amazing. Yeah. It's really potent. Thank you. Even patients will tell us, like, when we tell them to add a their salad. As soon as you rip it and throw it in, you're just like, smiling. Okay, and then we have three tablespoons of pecorino. Um, I really love pecorino cheese. It does um, impart, like, a salinity. gets, like, a little saltiness to it. It's, like, more of a sharp profile, which is really good. Um, if you are... Cuisinart has like a little hole where you can pour in a little olive oil at a time. Go for it. I'm going to pour the whole thing in. Okay, so I have a cup of olive oil here. Ta da! And it's going to get loud again for a second. Let's mix this up. Excellent. And that's it. You have pesto. It's so <laughs> fast and easy. And I make like a large batch. I make a large batch and stick it in the freezer. Um, you can put it in like ice cube trays. Ice cube trays, yeah, exactly. I put it in like a little plastic thing so I can just scoop out what I need. Yeah, and you can put a little bit of more uh, um, olive oil on top to keep it from oxidizing yes. and going brown. And so that's it still will taste good, but it will not whatever. Um, yeah. So these we cooked in a grill pan earlier, but the magic of webinars, we're not doing that right now. Um, you can cook it in a grill pan. You it's can it's it. quick. It's, it's quick. quick. It's like three or four minutes. Um, you know, you're just constantly turning them. Um, you can do it in a grill pan. You can do it on a grill. You can do it under the boiler. Just be careful. If you use wooden skewers, make sure you soak them. Um, you know, you also don't even have to use skewers. 
but it does sort of look like a barbecue like that. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, you could just put it on a sheet pan and roast it. Okay, so here are our skewers. I just drizzled some of the pesto. If you want to grab the salad, we'll put this all for you guys to check out. Yes. Ooh. And that's our cooking demo. Yes. So, you know, again, even with the skewers, like if garlic's a trigger, maybe you just put a little bit of pesto, or you, you know, sort of manage it that way as well. Right, or you use a little bit of garlic oil in it instead, yes. and then you just have the herbs. Exactly, exactly. Yeah. So I hope that that was fun for you guys and insightful and thoughtful, and hopefully we have some time for a little bit of questions. Yeah. questions. New questions. And I think maybe Jocelyn's going to share our last slide. Hey, thank you all for um, tuning in for this session. That was a fantastic demo. Thank you both. Um, we have some great questions so far. Oh, and I should say, um, you know, for time purposes, we didn't do main courses, but we gave you guys some, some recipes there for you guys to play around with, okay? Yes, following um, today's session, we'll be sharing a link to the recording as well as a handout with all the information we went over um, and some recipes, including these, as well as others for, for Maine. So keep an eye out for that. Um, we do have some great questions here. So I'm going to start with this one. We have a question from Megan asking, do you have a recommendation for FODMAP friendly prebiotics or probiotics? I just finished two rounds of an antibiotic and looking to establish a healthy gut bacteria again. So maybe you can talk about kind of the role of probiotics and prebiotics in general, um, and then if you have any recommendations as well. Yeah, I think um, with the prebiotics, like, you know, we're saying that's not the only way to nourish your microbiome. It's right. one of like their preferred foods. Um, so if you're at a point where you're unable to explore some of those, like I wouldn't feel um, down and out, like you're not you're not nourishing your gut. You know that's why we had gone over some of those other options. Um, a lot of the prebiotic food fibers are are FODMAP, FODMAP. Um, but maybe this is an opportunity to try all the enzymes. And see how that exactly. A lot of those are the fructans and the GOS, and that's what FODMAP can help to cover. And so you know it's a great yeah. way to sort of add those in and to nourish those bugs. Um, you know, and be able to have those prebiotic foods. Probiotics, the jury is still out on probiotics. <laughs> um, right. You know, the research is changing every day. And so we typically, I would say, you know, it depends. Like if somebody it comes to us and they have vector ulcer, for example, they're, they're waiting to eradicate that. Um, like we, we're not going to go in probiotic for them because that might exacerbate their symptoms. Right, right. Exactly. Um, and we tend to say, you know, for people, have more, add more fruits and vegetables to your diet. And, you know, some of those fermented foods, things like yogurt, um, kimchi, tofu, not right. tofu, sorry. Uh, <laughs> yeah, any of those. Pickles, pickles sauerkraut, sauerkraut, those things. Buy them in the uh, refrigerated because that assures that there's bacteria. Um, and those we tend to, you know, recommend more than a probiotic per se. Yeah, and pro yeah, and, and these things have to be they have to have live microorganisms in them to be effective. Right. So how do we know for sure that those are live? So um having that diversity in your diet can just up your chances for all of these things. So you don't have to hyper focus and worry too much on one one thing if that makes sense. Thank you. Yeah, that's very helpful. I know it's a topic that we could spend a whole hour <laughs> discussing, but thank you for that um summary. Um, I'm going to go on to our next question. So here, Ashley asks, does Fodzyme have plans to develop a product that works on polyols? So I can address this yes. one. <laughs> yes, we do. We're working very hard on a polyol targeting enzyme. We have some really promising results so far. Um, I don't have an update or timeline to share on when to expect that, but keep an eye out. Um, we've got some really great R&D that's happening, as well as some kind of broader um, strategy on commercialization and how to really bring it to market in the, the best way. So more to come on that. Um, <laughs> our next question um, here we have from John asking, beyond a single meal, over what period of time does stacking occur? As examples, does the FODMAP content of breakfast affect my tolerance for 
or in stacking at dinner, do the FODMAP stack from dinner to breakfast, et cetera. Great question. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, everybody's GI transit time is different. Exactly. Right. A GI transit time meaning how much time you go and it's your mouth through the time it goes out. Um, <laughs> so it really depends on the individual. Again, you know, you have to see what your tolerances are. But generally, they say between four and six hours, you should be okay. But again, it has to be individualized. Yeah, like so, um, to give you an example, if we're working with a patient and appropriate and necessary and have them, you know, track their food and symptom intake for a week or so, we have an app that does that for them. And then we're able to see when the symptoms start, what time, and, and what kind of symptoms um, that can give us a general idea like, hmm, is this occurring in the stomach? Is this occurring in the colon? Was this for lunch or was this for breakfast? So we do play a little detective like that. Um, and that's something that if you work with someone, you can maybe try to figure out, but or just be mindful of it to yourself while you're eating to better know, your, to know yourself. Yeah. Great. Thank you both. Um, here, we have a question from Chantel asking, why is it that when I take a walk or garden, I get even more bloated? Um, and so maybe in answering this question, you could kind of just um, address some of the different factors that may be playing a role um, in bloating and how kind of physical movement or any kind of activities may um, influence symptoms um, alongside what you're eating. Yeah, I mean, that's, um, that's sort of a broad question that it could be quite frankly, anything, but something that could potentially contribute is like, do you typically do that after a certain time passes after you've eaten? Um, are you um, wearing maybe snugger pants that when you're bending down and gardening, that's like making it feel more um, exaggerated? Um, what else could it be? Yeah. I'm I mean, not, you know, typically walking and stuff um, and helps movement move helps to move things and help to eliminate it. So I think we would have to do a little bit more research into why it would be, or just like when, when I keep saying we work some with somebody, but when we're working with somebody, we don't just talk about their GI symptoms and like the food that they're eating, but their lifestyle, so that it can give us clues to like what might be triggering, what else might be triggering. Thank you. Yes, definitely um, important to be addressing what's individually happening. Right. Um, yeah. Yeah. Honestly, there's a lot of great. <laughs> <laughs> and why everyone should follow up to um, schedule an appointment or at least get to um, have some one-on-one -on -one time with you both because there's so much more to dive into. Oh, yeah, yeah. thanks. <laughs> and, you know, we do offer a complimentary consultation. Yes, please yeah. tell the audience about that. We'd love to. Yeah, uh, just so you hear your story and then we let you know, give you an idea of like how we might help because we don't have like a one-size-fits-all approach to everybody. So once we get a little information, we can sort of give you an idea and set some expectations of what might happen if we work together. Exactly. Perfect, great. Um, and then I'm gonna take one last question here and then we'll um, thank you all for your time. So here the question is, hi, from Mirna, can you mix in the Fodzyme throughout the recipe and store it away in the refrigerator or should the Fodzyme be sprinkled just prior to consuming the foods? Um, so I can also kind of address this one. Um, it's a fantastic question and one that we hear pretty often here at Fodzyme. Um, and the first way to kind of start thinking about the answer here is really just to remind ourselves that Fodzyme works by targeting the FODMAPs directly. So it's working on the food. It's not working on the body. So the moment it kind of comes into contact with any um, food that has FODMAPs in it that we target, you know, that's when it starts breaking down the FODMAPs. So yes, you know, you can put it on the, the food, um, let it sit, and it will start breaking down those, those FODMAPs. And by the time you start eating it, um, it's, it's a lower FODMAP product. Um, you could sprinkle it just before eating. And then as you're chewing, you're kind of integrating the, the enzymes into the food, and they're all passing through the digestive tract together. So there's well, really that's a great point. We didn't mention that chewing. Yeah, yes, that's yeah. a huge tip. The better you chew, the less work and the easier things are. <laughs> Absolutely. And, you know, our um, saliva even has digestive enzymes in it naturally that, you know, they don't target FODMAPs, but they work in the same way that uh, 
you know, Fadzheim would be working. So the more that you're homogenizing and mixing up the saliva, the digestive enzymes, all these things that are breaking down the food and supporting overall digestion, that means that by the time, you know, your meal arrives in, you know, the rest of your digestive tract, your stomach, your intestines, your um, colon, you know, it's all more supportive of this better kind of absorption, less likely to cause those symptoms that, you know, we're all trying to avoid. So I hope that that's helpful. Um, and with that, I'm going to um, wrap up our session. Um, again, if there is any kind of final message that you want to share with the audience about um, your practice, how they can get in touch with you, please do let us all know. Oh, thanks. Yeah, I mean, we mentioned earlier, our job is to help you feel better, find peace, go out, have fun. And we play a life back. Yeah, we play a little detective work sometimes by the clues that you provide us with the kind of symptoms you're having, the foods you're eating, and all that. So we help you manage that so you feel empowered, you have your tools moving you forward, and go have fun. So please feel free to reach out. This was so fun. This was so fun. We had such a good time. Yeah. Enjoy our summer. Us. Enjoy those barbecues and the summer soirees. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you so much for having us. Amazing. Thank you both. Thank you so much.